we were kidding each other on WhatsApp. <laughs> so Amrish and I go go back a long way, but uh, but more formally, uh, he is a graduate of IIT Bombay from UC Santa Barbara and worked in the Valley for you know for almost 28 years or so, and uh, worked in several startups. He's always been a startup. That's one thing. I think. Few years in the beginning, he may have worked at, at larger, larger companies, but as far as I remember, I only remember Amrish working in startups. Uh, he's been kind of the you know the first, second, third person in, in a company called Balisert, which was uh, at uh, one time you know setting the pace on what digital certification was and all of that. We'll talk more about that in the second talk, I think. He's now uh, at Edmodo, which is one of the largest ed tech companies. And today is going to be about uh, startup life and something like the some of the myths and some of the what's good and the bad we have the I guess. So with that, short introduction of Rich. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Rich. Here you go. So I guess uh, I should start with asking you guys, what are you looking for from this talk? Because this in some sense is kind of what I have done over time. I'm happy to take it off in slightly different directions if the slides don't map to what you would like to hear. But anybody has any thoughts around what they would like to hear? A lot of you are from Netcore. So you've kind of seen a little bit of a startup now. No, no, no. Couple. Okay. Okay. So, but anybody has any particular thoughts of what they would like to hear? Or? So, what are your key learnings in terms of uh, tech and business in Silicon Valley? Any key insights? Okay. Okay. So, let me make uh, if I don't address that, uh, let's make sure that I cover it in some of the uh, latter sections. Um, and otherwise, from uh, Just curious. So, anyone else, anything? So, what makes a startup different than uh, say any other mid size or larger company? Okay, that I think I definitely have a slide on. Uh, okay. Just share some of the some of the best and bad or worst experiences. Okay. All right. So, so let me try and do stuff, and then we'll see where we land up. So, uh, quick background: born over here in Bombay, went to IIT Bombay. Uh, did around 11 startups uh, where I actually either wrote code or managed people. Uh, outcomes vary quite dramatically. And, uh, you know, again, my experience I've been an engineer all throughout, happy to stay an engineer, get a little bit involved in sales, get a little bit involved in pitching, but all from a very engineering focused perspective. <coughs> so, uh, try to stay mildly honest in my conversations and dealings with people. Um, again, every startup is going to be different. People's experiences with startups are going to be different. Part of, uh, at least for me generally, there has been a certain amount of a chalta hai attitude and acceptance of things the way they are. So I don't expect my startup to be doing a particular different thing. As I've as I've grown a little bit older, I'm kind of noticing a little more impatience and, you know, want people to have more of an edge when they're doing things, and I'll talk about some of that stuff. Uh, but uh, generally, it's all good, right? So, so everything that I say in this particular talk, you take with a bucket of salt, you know, it's my set of experiences, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of talk about the good parts of startups. In a okay, so startups over, I guess, the last uh, since approximately 95, 96 have been a really, really, really cool thing, right? People saw Netscape go public, people saw Yahoo go public, uh, 
there was this whole thing of, you know, you can go join a company in three or four years, become a millionaire. I was in Silicon Valley in 2000, when being a millionaire, you kind of thought that you were really poor, right? This was seriously the way the valley operated. Fair? Not fair? Uh, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was very much the attitude. Uh, guys for joining companies were given BMWs as their starting bonuses. So there was a really crazy heavy time around that thing. Uh, then at some stage reality hit in uh, 2000, 2001. Stock market tanked very dramatically. Uh, startups went through a very low mean phase. And now while startups have again started doing very well and again, I think valuations have started becoming a little frothy. People have at least not been quite as crazy as they were in 2000. People are still looking for revenue models. People are still looking to figure out how you're going to make work, make money, right? And the one place where this is not completely true is in the social networking world because the feeling in general is that in social networking there is one person who is going to be the big gorilla, right? And once you are the big gorilla, then you are going to make money in some way, you go figure that out. But there will only be one big gorilla, so there's a big land grab and people are willing to spend a lot of money. And while, you know, the Amazon, Flipkart, Snapdeal thing is not quite a social network, there is that whole land grab situation that's happening over there. Right? And similarly with Uber and with uh, your Olas and your Lyfts and all these guys, all of these guys are again trying to do a land grab so that they just own mind share. So they are the default provider for that thing. And we'll figure out the large amounts of money later. Fair enough. But anyway, the stats, generally one in 10 VCs actually has a great outcome. VC funded startups has a great outcome. One to 10% of startups end up getting VC funded. So there are a reasonably large number that don't even get VC funding, right? So probability of a good outcome out of a startup or the economics of a startup are iffy, right? In some ways, uh, financially, it might actually pay you more to go join an Oracle and, you know, do a steady job, get stock options out there as the company grows and that's not an unreasonable way to do things financially. But from an excitement perspective, I don't know that that is true at all. So uh, the, the other thing also around startups, even in Silicon Valley, is there are very few startups that are going out and doing something that is dramatically different and new. Right? A lot of startups are doing that. So find that this thing, you know, it was like pets.com going out and selling you pet store supplies online. Fine, you know, somebody came up with an idea, there was this whole thing of being in the cloud, e-commerce, all that stuff. People had already figured that out, now you're kind of doing another data. Right? In some sense, while Uber has done some semi-interesting things, a lot of it is also not that innovative. They've built a decent app around stuff. And in some sense, a lot of the innovation has been a little bit around business models and a lot of it has been around fighting regulations more than it has been around providing something where you say, wow, that is really cool, right? When the first mobile phone came out, that was really cool. When Tesla came out, that was really cool. Uh, there's a lot of other things where it's, yeah, sure. But, but companies do succeed and startups do succeed. So most startups succeed I just come to that slide. Actually, I guess my next slide is kind of around startups, right? Uh, uh, okay, so the hard parts of a startup. Uh, the most important thing is if you have a co founder or co founders, it is your relationship with them, right? This has to be a relationship where you trust each other, you're going to be interacting with each other for a very long time. Uh, so part of it has to be trust, part of it has to be even uh, not just financial trust, but trust in competence, trust in the fact that if somebody is running a part of the thing, you can trust that they will make the right decisions. You can argue about things, but there has to be that level of, okay, if this is, you know, what you are running, go run it, uh, you get to make the final decision. 
So that level of trust often is very hard to keep up and maintain. Right? Uh, uh, and this does become like a marriage. Right? You're spending as much time with this person as you're going to be spending with your wife. Um, uh, the other part is kind of trying to figure out what is the right thing to do and finding an idea that you think is worth doing and being able to validate that that idea is something that's really worth. Uh, part of it, you know, it's so one of the things I think, the well, persistence is I think on my next slide, but um, part of it over here is figuring out an idea that isn't a feature, uh, getting people either first to talk to you from a validation perspective, getting people to talk to you afterwards if they're customers, right? If you are in a mid-sized company, if you're in a large company, the name of the company opens a set of doors for you, right? So you can walk in there, people will say, you are from Netcore at this stage, Netcore is an established name, somebody from the you know, IT office will happily entertain a call from you, right? In a startup, that is much, much, much harder, right? A few orders of mine. So rejection is something that you have to be able to deal with a lot more than you do in uh, this. Right? Again, in engineering, I think the rejection bit of it is a little bit toned down, but in sales, it is it is a, a really hard factor. Um, now there is uh, 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 two parts. Right? So, so one is being able to stay focused and follow through with the ideas. Right? There's a set of people like jumping to new things often. Here's a shiny new idea, the grass, grass is always greener. If you went out and did something new, you know, there's a lot more money out there. So part of it is learning to stay focused on what you are doing. On the other hand, there is also a part of uh, learning how to pivot. Sorry, this is not projecting the way I wanted it. Ah, oh, okay, sorry. The slide is grown a little bit more. Um, okay. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, so learning how to stay focused on what you need to do and learning when is the right time for you to see that there are market signals that tell you that you need to pivot and go in a different directions. Right? Most times when you're doing a startup, you want to head over there and you often need to go off 30, dire 30 degrees, 45 degrees in a different direction just to go make things work. And uh, one example was at Valisar, we said that we were going to do digital certificates and digital certificate validation, right? So the first thing is we had this cool new way of doing it that we wanted the world to adopt. You know, we were a company of two or three people, maybe we had raised a few million dollars. You were trying to ask people like Netscape, Microsoft, all of these guys to build logic into their browsers into their platforms to go support these things that you as a little itty bitty company are trying to say is how you should do validation. Let me, let me explain certificate validation a little bit, right? A good example is when you have a credit card, the fact that you have a credit card says something about you. The fact that you have money in your account is a second level of validation. So there your bank is asserting that it is okay for this transaction to go through the credit limit has not been exceeded. This is, you know, an appropriate transaction to happen. Right? So we were trying to do that validation with things called digital certificates. And now maybe I'm getting a little bit into the weeds. But the answer is we were trying to push a particular technology, trying to get a bunch of large companies to adopt it. Very, very, very hard to do. Then we had to go join the standards board and kind of push something that was a standard. Right? So other people, you had to rally other people around that particular standard. So that couldn't be something that we own IP or patents on. Because other people would say, why am I going to adopt something that you guys own? So you had to kind of say, okay, fine, let's build something that is completely available to everyone. And we'll try and figure out ways of fitting our standards into these things. Right? Or our proprietary technologies into so was that the right thing to do? Uh, yes, because if we hadn't done that, people would just have said, go away. Right? We'll figure out some other way of doing this. Right? So, uh, so yes, we had to do it, and uh, that was the way you had to get an option. Right? 
so, so, so part of it is yes, learning to do these twists and turns. And by the way, often the question of what is right and wrong is a hard one to answer. Yeah, but, in, comes, but in hindsight, now you can answer. Well, even in hindsight, it is the story that I create around that thing too, yeah. right? And, and I, I don't know if I talk. I have a, a, a point in my thing, right? But when people tell you they know why Facebook is successful, these are all theories, right? Finally, it was it happened. Yeah. I don't know that I would even trust Zuckerberg's response to that question, right? So, uh, so, uh, but if you ask me, yes, in my opinion. Uh, even in hindsight, that was the right thing to do. It actually did get us a lot of traction because it got us into a lot of banks. And often the other very interesting things about startups is there is an idea that you are selling to people and then there is what they actually use from what you're selling. And those two can be very different. The idea is gorgeous for getting your foot in the door and then what people actually use is something that is much more mundane. But that's okay because you have a thought leadership, right? So, for example, in this whole PKI world and certificate validation, because I was writing those standards, that, and then because we had implemented it first, right? There were a set of banks that came and said, "Okay, we want to implement this particular standard because we want to do all these cost-related trans, you know, uh, tra financial transactions on top of it." So, we actually had, I think, eight of the ten largest banks as our customers as really a nobody, a no-name company. Right. So, riding on the standards thing, right, uh, getting onto this thing of, you know, we are the idea people, is worth a lot. Right. Um, going back to the staying focused thing, right? one thing as I said is, staying focused even in terms of technology. Learning to use technology for Figure out what you need to do and figure out the simplest way to make it happen. Right? Often as engineers, we end up wanting to build the perfect solution or we want to build something that is going to work really well five years from now. In general, don't bother. In three years, you'll rewrite this code anyways. Right? And you'll rewrite them with a set of things that have happened that you will not even remotely anticipated. So trying to design for great scalability in some direction is not the right thing to do very often, right? Build something, build something that people can use, start getting traction, see how people use this particular thing, and then go out and figure out where you need to worry about scaling. Right? The other rule around performance is don't try and figure out your performance, you know, don't do dumb things, but don't try and figure out your right performance optimization till you figure out how the system is being used, and then go figure out where you need to optimize your behavior. <laughs> the rest of it say, you know, it's okay, you'll deal with the, uh, the, the inefficiencies. Slide, oh, there's a lot of this slide that's not showing up. Um, you want to just raise it and go out of it? I don't you? think I can because to take me to the next slide. Uh, right, you have a conversation with one person, you have him transmit that same conversation to the next person. And you try and see what that guy heard from what you said, and you will. That whole Chinese whispers game, it is amazingly true at work, right? Uh, and this has got nothing to do with startups, but I think there's a, a workaround solution for that is hmm. feedback. You tell if uh, you told me something hmm. before telling it to the next person, if I confirm what I've heard from you. That could decrease that. That would decrease it, yes. And getting everyone to behave that way is Very doesn't happen, right? And you know, often when somebody says, Yes, I understood you, it becomes mildly hard to say, okay, repeat for me what you understood. <laughs> uh, so so the mechanics of that is the obvious. That is why there's a solution, it's called the uh, WhatsApp. Well, then you have to communicate directly, but often, you know, if you have a manager of a group, then the manager doesn't like it if you're communicating to the group directly, so you're trying to kind of follow the hierarchy a little bit, and that results in its own set of problems, but... then there's another solution, it's called Yammer. <laughs> Yammer and WhatsApp and... What I mean? Yammer, Joy. Slack. Ah. ah, Slack, Yammer, yeah. Ah, there you go. 
the city the other is around the property right so again it always feels like if i did something a little bit different there was one startup i was at worked with an incredibly smart guy still love the guy we built three prototypes in a nine month period so from a learning perspective it was phenomenal the three prototypes were in reasonably different areas right so as i said i kind of learned about three semi different industries in a nine month period but we didn't stick to any one of them right and that i think in hindsight was a mistake right uh, so uh, anyways so there's that right so so at some stage that persistence and stick to itiveness is worth a lot this time um and you have to kind of deal with times when things are dark things are bad everything feels like you know there are dark clouds in the sky nothing good is going to happen and then some random event happens you've been talking to so many people one guy says okay let's try and do a pilot that's your big breakthrough and something great happens right a good example at balasa we had gone to rsa which is a big show in security we were trying to hand over cds of our software we trying to get people to buy it for a thousand bucks we could not get anyone to buy a copy right our sales uh, one of our international sales guy he went to australia and he sold them an affiliate model where they could resell our stuff for you know something like uh, 85000 bucks right now when you can't give away something for a thousand bucks and somebody's doing an 85000 deal the story changes right and then we became all about selling affiliate models where other people could resell us so so where that lightning is going to strike and where good things are going to happen hard to say but those things happen luck happens luck happens for everyone uh, sometimes you need to give it a little bit um okay i talked about knowing when to pivot uh, so both these two are kind of related and kind of opposite pieces of advice but that's life right so one says stick to whatever it is you're doing the other is learn when to not when to figure out that someone's telling you strongly enough not to uh, hiring in startups also <coughs> is quite hard right unless you are one of these really cool companies and you've developed a buzz around you right so for example the top vc has gone out and said you are the best company since sliced bread and that's why people are falling all over to join the join you and you know google at some stage had achieved that kind of a thing yahoo had achieved it netscape had achieved it let's get very early on right so until you get to that state attracting good people is hard right because part of what you're doing is you're saying look ideally try and take a little bit less money uh, because money is obviously always king uh, take a little bit less money with some stock options in the book that the stock options are right and again there were times when this worked really 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 well in the 99 2000 you know 98 99 time frame people would happily forego you know 40 50% of their salary for stock options uh, after the bust it was really hard to give away your stock options to people so those things all that uh, and hiring good people is always critical i don't think that kind of needs much in terms of saying so is there a litmus test on when to pivot or not <sighs> if i knew the answer to that boss <laughs> I would be giving talks for a hundred thousand bucks a pop. <laughs> no, there is. Uh, okay. okay. So, but there are a lot of fun parts to startups, right? And this is partly why I think this is an environment that I enjoy a lot more. Always a lot of new things to learn. Again, going back to the Valis updates, right? I used to be an engineer. I used to kind of understand how to write good code. that was all i understood uh join valisa okay boss who's going to manage all the it infrastructure who's going to manage the connectivity to the world who's going to manage dns who's going to manage right the sort of things which you know technically software engineers were meant to do that's what the it guys did right but the interesting thing is actually learning about those be forced to learn about those things was fine but learning about those things has ended up being very valuable for me later on in life even when dealing with security right so now when people talk about access points and now what can an access point do how can an access point mislead me 
How are people doing things like DNS poisoning? All of these kinds of things happen because I was forced to learn something that I had no desire to particularly learn, but I just had to do it. Right? So there's a set of interesting things that get thrown at you when you are going out and doing a business deal, when you are going out and pitching to a VC. Right? All of these things you learn because you're kind of forced out there. And you pick up, right? The first three times you do something wrong, you kind of try and group back and say, okay, what is the feedback that we feel we got from this piece? And then you try and retune your story a little bit. Alright, uh, a lot of growth career wise, particularly if your startup even is mildly successful, right? Because now suddenly you've kind of gone from being an engineer to being a manager or being an architect or being a whatever. And you can say, I did this, that, and the other. The next place, excuse me, place that you go to, you're going to have much more leverage. Right? Because now you, are, you have learned to do a wide variety of things and you can kind of solve a set of problems for people that are Okay. Uh, uh, getting to wear many hats falls in a little bit with this learning uh, set of uh, uh, set of interesting things. Figuring out, uh, okay, uh, I guess. It looks like a previous. Thing. This, huh? It looks like a previous. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, that looks like a previous. Thing. Uh, ah, there you go. Okay. Uh, very little bureaucracy. Very little politics. Uh, depending on the size of your startup, and startups do tend to grow to 100 plus people. But at smaller sizes, you know, everyone talks to everyone. There isn't as much about positioning. And when I said about, you know, hey, I want to talk to him, but I need to talk through you, uh, that stuff doesn't happen quite as much if your startup is a little bit smaller. Most people understand who's doing what in the company and how much people are contributing. So you're not as worried about. Face time, we're not worried about, you know, okay, coming into the office at 9 o'clock, you know, staying in late or something like that. Right? It's not the hours that matter, it's kind of what's your work. And that happens a lot more in a startup than it happens in larger companies. Right? In larger companies, that face time, my boss seeing that I'm in the office is often more important than the amount of work that I'm getting. Right? So those things uh, are kind of, they just tend to be cleaner in mind. Um, not a lot of inherited code, this is at least for the engineering geeks around here. You don't have to go fix other people's code. The other side of uh, startup is generally you are picking some large open source piece of software and making changes in it. So you do need to understand that large open piece of software and that in some sense is inherited code but you are hoping that other people are supporting that a little bit better and you are the only person. You are the person. Right. So this is a little bit of the, sorry, was there a question or a comment. Uh, by the way guys, feel free to interrupt at any time. Uh, uh, um, not a lot of customers to worry about, so you can kind of go make changes. You don't have to worry about backward compatibility, you don't have to worry about migrating data, you don't have to worry about saying, oh boss, the database table change here, yeah, we now, you know, it takes me 7 hours or 13 hours to go make a change on the database thing, how am I going to deal with that? So, a lot of those things are a little bit easier. You can say, well, scrap that whole thing and change it and bring it another way. So, so, from an engineering perspective, it's a little bit fun. And it acts as a huge adrenaline rush. Right? So, you really are in a big roller coaster ride all the time. You get one deal. Uh, so, this co founder of mine in Dallas said, right? he used to kind of come in uh, and talk about how there was an uptick today, and the uptick would be. We got a meeting with the following VC, or we got a meeting with this person, and you know we met some big cryptographer, and uh, he's kind of going to go join our technical advisory board. So each of these things is a big event when you are a really small company, and so these kind of events you can thrive upon. Right? And there are downtimes too, and you know some deal fell through. Uh, there's that, but it is always it's it's never boring, right? My Biggest beef with being at a large company, I used to tell people this. Uh, I was at Cadence for a certain amount of time while I was getting my game plan, right? And the thing was, I used to always think to myself, if I did not turn up to work for a whole month, 
the only person who would notice would be my boss. Say, ki boss, he's got attendance thing. Right? But in reality, would it make a difference to the company? Would our sales numbers go down by 2%? And if they don't, you know, okay, so now what is my value in this whole system, right? And that I've always found a little bit hard to figure out in large companies, which is part of the reason why I care so much about startups and why you know, they just put out for fun. It's, it's much more honest than a large company in some sense. What you do is, you know, while there is an amount of luck involved, what you do is what you're going to benefit from or lose out from, and that's it. Right? So it's a much fairer system than a large company where the sales guy, how effective the sales guy is, and how effective the VP of sales is, is going to matter much more to your company's performance than anything that you do. Okay, myths, facts, whatever. Uh, I don't think people work as hard as everyone claims, right? This whole thing around burning the midnight oil, I don't think really happens, right? I find people work as hard as it is often fun for them. Right? And particularly in this age where, uh, again, at least in the US, we have the millennials coming in and there is a little more, I'm on TV, I really should be saying this, but there is a certain more sense of entitlement. And I think this is happening a little bit in Silicon Valley, right? Software engineers are hard to find. There is a certain feeling that people are doing you a favor by working. Right, if we're working for the company. Um, there isn't necessarily as much of a thing, boss, if there is a customer situation, come hell or high water, we need to solve this customer situation. Right? If a deal is going to fall through, you just do whatever it takes to make that deal happen. Right? Um, so, firstly, I don't think, in general, nobody can sustain, you know, I don't think even 13, 14 hour work weeks, right? I and mean, Elon Musk might be able to do 14 hour work weeks over long stretches and you know, I have other friends who can do stuff like that. Most people can't. One of the most productive engineers I knew used to work 8 hours a day. But the 8 hours that he did was so incredibly solid, they were worth more than 12 hours for the day. Right? So he was not distracted, he did not go read news articles, he did not go read random stuff while he was at work. Right? So, 8 hours of focus work, frankly, even 6 hours of focus work is worth its weight in gold. Right? Both focus work and smart work. Right? I mean, if you're doing dumb work, if you're kind of repeatedly doing a mechanical task, there are people who are hard workers who aren't working smart. That's never going to be. Right? Startup, large company doesn't. Anyway, so, that was the other point around working smart is worth a lot more than working hard, as far as I'm concerned. Six hours of solid work is worth it. Crunch times happen. Crunch times, as I said, part of that whole attitude you must come hell or high water, we will solve this customer's problem. That is worth You know, it's very important. People remember that kind of stuff. People remember sacrifice that you made. But frankly, any company that expects it to be crunch time continuously is not going to be able to retain good people. The good people will burn out. They will not end up being productive. It just doesn't end up being a good If people are working hard because they're enjoying it, because it's fun, because they're learning new stuff, that's good. Right? If you're trying to make people work hard long term, that's not something that I think sense. Okay. Is this... Okay. Luck in startups matters a lot. Right? And I don't care whether Elon, I don't know how many people have read Elon Musk stuff. He came close to bankruptcy with both of his SpaceX and uh, uh, Tesla. Right? Both companies were at bankruptcy, he invested pretty much all his money from previous companies in there. He was ready to sell out and then he got a deal last month. And he got deals on both companies in the last month. And they hadn't happened, both companies were not happened. So, luck matters in every startup. Often, if you have some bandwidth and some time, 
luck happens, lightning strikes somewhere or the other and you just need to spread out, give lightning some time to strike for you, but uh, uh, good things happen. You know, part of it is you want to spread your net while you want to be talking to a whole lot of people, good stuff happens. Um, another thing, this happens in Silicon Valley so with a lot of founders, right, is you want to be really secretive around your idea and say, boss, this is an absolutely brilliant idea. I don't want to tell anyone till you know I've finished my patent, till I've built my product, till everything is ready. It's generally a bad idea, right? And there might be a small number of cases where this is worth it. And you know, if you're doing a deep fundamental thing, that might be true. For most software, your idea isn't that great. It, a lot of your software, your your company's success is going to depend on execution. A lot of it is going to depend on support from other people. Part of the good thing about and valuable thing about Silicon Valley is that support structure is there. There are enough people who have been through startup who have kind of felt the pain of startups who will be willing to go out and help. We'll go out of the way to help. We'll go out of the way to connect you to somebody else who might be able to help. Right? But that's going to happen if I go out and talk to 10 people, 20 people and give them a chance to kind of connect me to other people and allow them to talk about what I'm doing. Right? Because often people forget what you have told them within three days of ITIS. Right? So you have to kind of try and stay top of mind, you have to get the other guy to talk about you so that you can get that. Right? There are a number of uh, there are a small number of cases where you know VC likes the idea, doesn't like the team, will try to go out and get someone else to build it. On rare occasions that succeeds, but I think that's generally rare occasions. Right? And people have occurred, uh, you know, accused Zuckerberg of stealing an idea of the whatever brothers. But you know, there have been so many startups which have been in extended stealth modes. What about that? Yeah, and I'm not sure that that generally buys a lot. Sometimes the extended stealth mode, if you're using it as a marketing technique, Maybe, right, so you know, you can kind of attract candidates. Otherwise, I'm not sure it buys them, right? Give me some, I mean, I can't think of great examples that necessarily. There were two, uh, I can't recall their name, but they were into a defense program. Huh, uh, one is this, yeah. Palantir is one, huh? Yeah, yeah. Some, some a name like that. Huh. And then they had an anxiety connection where they were forced to be into stealth mode for a couple of years. Palantir. Palantir. Yeah. So Palantir is one of them now since Palantir was selling into defense. Um, and there was also a space, a space related startup. Doing material technology. Smart material. So, okay. so smart materials, yeah, maybe yeah. there is some value in there, right? For a bulk of software related startups, which is very much my area, right? Most people are not doing very deep stuff, right? And again, you know, sure, there are there might be some people who are in deep learning who are doing such phenomenal work. That there is some very right. But this stage was Google is open sourcing half of its stuff, saying that look, it isn't the learning technology that's necessarily as deep as the fact that I have all this data to apply it, right? Now, other people don't have access to this data. At this stage, at Edmodo, I'm happy to give people access to my source code. Take my source code, do what you will with it. That's not as interesting as the fact that I have a network of 65 million users now, right? And those 65 million users and what they do on my side is what is much more valuable. And the fact that they used to come into my side, all of these things are worth it. So, at least in my head, my bias would be towards sharing things, right? Now, occasionally you can meet people who are hokey, right? And if you have enough sensitivity to saying boss hockey people because I'm person you don't want to associate then it doesn't work. Um, yeah and, and you know the answer is look for most startups to make them successful you kind of need to stick with them for long time right for a VC to go find somebody and say oh I like this idea go work on this idea I'll give you four million dollars that guy will go work on it with the passion that you will work on it doesn't happen to all does happen doesn't happen too often. Overall, in my mind, you would be better off by sharing stuff and by co-opting people rather than by the Um, You're going to be doing your startup for a hell of a long time. 
try and do something that you care about, try and do something that is fun, try and do something that excites you, try and do something that even if it fails, you will not feel that your three years or four years were wasted. You'll be able to feel that I learned something. And there are two parts to this. One is the attitude, right? Which is the acceptance to boss. The fact that my startup fails is not something that's going to go put me into a funk or a depression, right? It's a learning experience. Life is all about a learning experience. This is a way to get accelerated learning, right? So go do it. Um, the most painful part is, you know, when your startup shuts down in the first eight or nine months and you never get even one round of funding, you don't get to talk to enough people about it. Then the question is, what did you learn? But if you kind of get a chance to talk to enough people, learning to talk to people, learning to be, you know, good about that kind of stuff, is also worth its way to go. And the next job interview that you're going to go to, the guy's going to value you more just because you talk about it. Right? So, presentation skills are worth a lot. There's, you know, all these weird things that are worth a huge amount to you from a career perspective that I don't think you necessarily get from uh, going out there. Uh, give lightning a chance to strike. Okay, those were essentially my prepared slides at this stage. Feel free. Questions, thoughts, anything? So you mentioned <coughs> that these days in software, mm. there is not really the software that is that much differentiator. In fact, Many companies may use uh, open source or whatever. So is it really then the business models that are forming the unicorns as so, opposed to technology? No, there is a whole lot in execution. Part of execution is around your software. Part of it is around things like look and feel. Part of it isn't how good are you about onboarding your customers, how easy do you make it for your customers to use your product, uh, how good are you at getting the word out about what you are doing. None of which is technology. None of, your software is your technology, user interface is your technology by some definition. Um, the techniques that you use to get the word of mouth out are partly technology and maybe partly not, but growth does not happen by itself. Growth happens because you do a set of things. Some of them might be giving people access to which people have signed on, have not signed up for 28 days. Right? This is one of the things that we are doing at Edmodel, right? We want to grow. Part of growth is getting new users, part of it is getting old users who might not have used the system for some time to come in and see what's new. Right? Part of it is getting some fresh stuff into our website all the time. Right? So I don't know whether you call that product or technology. These all funge together in my head. If you just call pure software development technology, you can do things inefficiently. You can do things where everything is hard to do. When somebody asks me for a new piece of data, right? So, okay, a marketing guy says, I would like to know this. If I take a week to get him that information and if I need to deploy two engineers to get him that information, that's one way of doing things. Then he will kind of stop asking me questions. If I can give him an answer in two hours, he will ask me ten more questions. Right? And because he's asked me ten more questions, he might get an insight that is going to be a strange one that he wouldn't have asked for. Or if he can play around with some of this data about who's coming, who's not coming, what, what kinds of things are they doing on the website, what sequence of events are happening. Right? All of this is technology. So, so technologies are a lot of these things. And yes, technology is important, execution is important, and they all help and contribute to building the channel. I guess what I'm asking is, from us, you were talking about the ratio of the VCs and the startup success. Hmm. Is there something that is exponential in the business model that that makes startups more successful in order to differentiate with some others in this case? So one example, you did affiliate like Uber, for example. 
no cars of their of their own, right? Different new business model. Whether like others are copying it, different. But Airbnb, Google in a way with with AdWords. You know, it's other people's websites. This thing or you search. You know, each one defined potentially. But Google did not Google invent Airbnb. Didn't invent AdWords. Right. Okay. Anyway, huh. but you but know, the the, if, the more user, uh, users there were, even if you talk about Uber, yes. right? The fact that there were people who were dispatchers who were in the business of outsourcing limo you know they worked with limo services or they worked with guys who were taxi owners right so that model had already been there ki boss you call this 1844 number and i will dispatch a cab to you i will do the advertising to make sure that people think of calling me right but what is airtel do today bharti airtel is purely a marketing company they do not own towers they do not own close to anything they are just doing marketing they are getting people to come and sign up and they are giving them a service i i, I think all the software is developed is outsourced so business models are one part of it I, again i kind of talk a little bit more about silicon valley where technology matters a certain amount and in uber's case i think Yes, I do grant you that that business model and that stuff was more valuable than the technology could have been, right? Uh, so technology contributes, and in some ways, yes, it was very disappointing to me at Valisar that at the end of it, the question is, technology maybe contributed 10% of our success. The fact, you know, the fact that I was talking in IETF, and therefore we got that was in some sense you could call that marketing. It was PR work. Right, that got us a set of our initial customers. That was so technically, then marketing mattered more than technology. It was marketing a little bit based on technology in a forum that was a little more technical. Right, so uh, it's a hard question to answer. And as I said, it will vary so much for companies. So again, in Valisar, one of our most successful products was a product that did secure transport of files. Okay. At that time, HTTPS already existed. There was secure FTP. Both of these existed products were available. Open source stuff was available. We picked those, and we built action things. Right. So you could kind of say, if I place a file in a folder, I know that it will reliably be delivered out there. Right. Not a lot of deep technology, but it's sold like hotcakes because it's all the business. Part. So yeah, technology matters a certain amount, but uh, my balloon got burst a certain amount in thinking that technology was the most important thing in the company. I don't say that even remotely anymore. My job is to make the technology be as efficient as I can make it be, so that people can go do interesting things and we can try to make us company more successful. You talked about. Uh, you didn't actually speak much about funding. The point that was there. Huh. Um, and how does uh, I mean how has the situation in the sense changed of funding with the relation to another point that you made over there of working smarter rather than longer? How what kind of pressure does funding put on your work uh, work hours? I don't know that funding puts pressure on your work hours. Okay, so funding is a awfully painful process. If someone has not done it. It is way, way, way more stressful than writing code of any form, and the reason is basically stuff is completely out of your control, right? You are going out, you are talking to people. Meetings are surprisingly more mentally exhausting than writing code, right? Uh, as I, I right now, I manage people, so I don't write code, but it is just so much more comfortable when you are writing code. You are in your own world. Uh, the code works or doesn't work based on what you have done. Okay, somebody is laughing. Somebody relates to this, right? You have you have reasonable control over your own destiny. And sometimes you are tearing your hair out around the bug, but when you solve it, you are really delighted with yourself. When you are raising funding, you are going out and talking to VCs. There's some subset of VCs who don't understand what you do very well, but they have the money. You kind of gotta go cater to them, whatever it is they want. You know, there's a set who've learned to be obnoxious, 
uh, you have to cater to them. There are uh, there is a huge amount of rejection. You have to deal with all of that. In a given day, if you do two meetings, that is really uh, getting meeting getting appointments is hard. In a day, if you do two meetings, you are wiped at the end of it, right? Uh, and you kind of it's something that you just can't control, right? After you talk to 28 VCs, the 29th one refunds you and the question is, should I stop, should I do something completely different, am I on the right path? And there isn't a way to answer that whole question of should I stick to it, should I pivot? You know, I wish I had the answer boss, here's the way to go figure out the thing, right? And there are cases of people who have not, who've got rejected, you know, 30 times and then got funded by the 31st person and who've gone out and created this. I see. So, what kind of pressure do they put on, on you? That's what I really want to know. Um, so, and again, this will vary so much from VC to VC. It will depend on how you're doing as a company. It depends on what you promised them and how much you're delivering what you promised. It depends on who your management team is. It depends on how much they trust your management team. It depends on how much the management team is able to shield the rest of the company from that. Uh, so there are a huge number of variables, <coughs> right? And depending on the company, the CEO can bear the brunt of it. The CEO can push some of that brunt onto people. If as a department you're not performing well, the pressure is going to increase. If you're performing well, then, you know, the VCs don't pay any attention to you, right? So at this stage, See, you know, as it is, I don't generally like talking a lot. Uh, this is a little bit of an exception, right? But I don't like talking much about meetings, right? So I have a set of slides, you know, pictures in them, which is kind of, uh, 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 right? They, they know, so I kind of have my seven, seven points of things that we've done. We haven't done engineering is executing well. Nobody's complaining about engineering. VCs are not at all interested. But then in India, you have a perfect case study of housing in Sequoia. That speaks everything. Of what? Oh, of housing. Housing, housing.com and huh. Sequoia. Huh. Everything's out in the open. So you know what kind of pressures come, right? Okay, so I, I don't know, I don't have any context with what's happening out there. Uh, so it was like 16, 17 IIT cases started off housing.com huh. and Sequoia huh. and internal backers and the CTO didn't get along with Sequoia, they wanted to push in a different direction, and turn and all that. Uh, board meetings, they were trying to boot out the uh, CTO, who was also a key founder and stuff, and uh, they wrote some emails against the VC, accusing them of... Uh, oh, they were all these all that that yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this is, this, is, this is one of the things that can very easily destroy companies, right? One is... It's a destroy the company. Yeah, break up between VCs and uh, the management team or within the company, right? So there was a startup I was at, this was not VC funded necessarily, but the VP of engineering, the VP of product management could not talk to each other, right? Now, if they can't talk to each other at that level, how are you going to go in one direction? And the point is the people that you are fighting are other companies that are trying to come into your space. But if you guys are not presenting them right in front, that other thing ain't happening. Right. So, within a company, I think it is the responsibility of everyone in management to make sure that while it is reasonable to have arguments, while it is very reasonable to have debates, while it is reasonable to push each other, you kind of need to make sure that there are certain lines that are not crossed. And that some of that, I mean, it stays positive and it doesn't become Corrosive, and that corrosive part can happen a little bit. If I have a, another question, you mentioned about another person not being as enthusiastic about your idea and working on it. Hmm. So if you are a person who's, go, who's founded a company, hmm. there is a lot of, uh, I mean, VCs generally want, don't want a company founded by one person. They are hmm. looking for co-founders, at least one to three. So how easy is it then to get co-founders? Um, so and often, the kind of people? often, 
sometimes things happen with one person kind of driving it. Mm -hmm. Often you will find that there are co-founders. Now one co-founder might take a technical role, so therefore you take a little bit of a step back from a line like perspective. But having two people be able to bounce ideas off each other. No, no, it's definitely worth a hell of a lot. have to uh, have two people, but when there is one person co-founding, how does one get another co-founder? What, what are the so you know in the Bay Area there is something called uh, co-founder dating, <laughs> right? So you actually have places where you have people, I mean the other mechanism is uh, you have meetups over here, you know, you put this talk up on same, a meetup. Same thing with in India. Right. So I don't know, yeah, I don't know about co-founder dating but... but uh, meet up for co-founder. Yeah. Nice. The other thing is again, right, if you go to a lot of meetups, you will end up running into a lot of other people who are trying to do startups, who want to do something, who have one skill set. You'll find engineers who want to go out on their own, but who don't have an idea if you are a marketing guy. Or if you are an a, a engineer, you might find a marketing guy who has an idea but no ability to implement it. Right? So that potentially becomes a good way of doing things. Sometimes it's two engineers kind of going out and bouncing ideas at each other. So, but that chemistry and some of that chemistry is very, uh, you know, again, what is the litmus test for whether that chemistry works or not? Dang, if I know. 70 co-founders, they are bound to be here. But it doesn't make war. sense to go for a co-founder uh, if you haven't known that person for a long time, right? Yeah. Um, going to be a you know, in some time. cases, in some cases, those relationships work out very quickly and you kind of just need to, if you spend a few hours with each other, you figure out that your general way of thinking is good, you're both reasonably smart guys, neither of you is, I mean, again, okay, this is my step, right, not particularly dogmatic about something, you're reasonable about, okay, you have this point of view, I have that point of view, are we okay with saying mine is wrong, are we not, that kind of stuff. Why you don't want to judge people really quickly, maybe it doesn't take that long either, right? So, but this is kind of what I feel after X number of years, uh, that you know, the people I've made friends with, I've made friends with relatively quickly. Then you have single co-founder successes like Admob. And you know, yes. I, and I don't know enough about the history of AdMob or uh, uh, stuff like that, but uh, sure. And Facebook is a good example. And actually, Tesla is not. Tesla is a strange example. The history around Tesla is a little more weird. Uh, you know, it's not like Elon Musk got up one day and said, "Boss, electric car. I want to make an electric car. Let's go find two engineers and build it." Uh, there is a more complicated history around that. So, sure, there are uh, single company people too, but I, I'm not even remotely saying that that's not Any other key insights on the business front that uh, you, know, you have noticed or experienced? Um, I think I gave you most of my key insights. What else would I think about from business front? Um, Figure out, figure out what works. So again, you know, I think consumer and enterprise are a little bit different. So I, most of my life I spent in enterprise. Uh, I've been in consumer mainly at Edmodo. This is kind of the first consumer play that I've been at. In the consumer world, at least, I would say, and this might even apply to the enterprise world, first go figure out what people find of value. Right? Don't necessarily worry about the revenue model. Right? Now this obviously happens if you can either self-fund or get money from someone else on faith right? to fund your initial stage. Right? And this partly depends on how old you are, how much of what's your risk taking profile, all of those things. Right? But the most important group really is Figure out what is going to work for your users. Your users might be enterprise users, they might be customers, they might be whoever. Once you figure that out, then the money bit of it or the customer bit of it or the payment bit of it is an easier to solve problem than the user bit of it. Right? 
um, getting users, growing users is a much harder, much, much harder problem than people expect. Right? A lot of people left Google saying, hey, boss, I understand technology well enough. I've been in Google for a few years, got this stuff clean, Google is confused, this, that, and the other. I will go to my own startup. They were a set that was successful. They were a large number that won. Right? Because they didn't realize how hard it was to get eyeballs. Eyeballs cost a huge amount of money. And getting people's attention is really, really hard. Right? Uh, Google used to say early on that they did not spend a dollar on marketing. Right? Uh, their marketing was a lot of it was word of mouth. And a lot of it was creating a buzz because people wrote about them. Right? So creating that buzz was their way of getting marketing while they didn't spend dollars. They spent a lot of huge smart brain cycles in figuring out what would be worth writing about. Right? This is without me having necessarily talked to Larry and Sergey to say, boss, did you guys consciously do this or not? But I think they're awfully smart guys who maybe naturally figure this out. So getting eyeballs, getting people, getting attention, right? As I said, getting people to talk to you, getting people to pay attention to you is an awfully, awfully, awfully hard problem. Right now at Edmodo, I'm happy to go, go talk to any edtech startup, right? And the biggest thing of that, and I have a very open conversation. Because finally, I have the eyeballs, right? Those eyeballs are worth, you know, that's kind of most of what Edmodo is. And uh, any key insights on the tech side when you want to get an MVP out the door? Should you cite insights like should you do A-B testing, any particular ideas to avoid? Or if you're doing an MVP, yeah. you don't have the ability to do A-B testing because you don't have users. Right? An MVP is a minimum viable product. So just trying to get something basic out. The answer is get it out quickly, get it out, you know. Know for a fact, right? Don't even trust. Know for a fact that you're going to change what you design. You're going to optimize what you. You're going to change what you need to optimize for. Users are going to want something that's going to be 30 degrees different from what you were planning to offer them. So, lots of stuff is going to change under you. And even if what you build as an MVP actually becomes the product, if you are able to raise money. Look, if I have 10 customers in an enterprise model or 3 customers in an enterprise model, people will give me money. I can go rewrite the crappy code that I wrote. Right? But getting those 3 customers and getting that money, that's much more. That's not in my control. That code is in my control. So if you're on the consumer side, how do you decide between how much of a raw app you should ship versus the huge list of features and perfection, visual design, you know? Where do you draw the cutoff? Um, so I haven't necessarily managed to get this executed on at Edmodo. Two or three things I believe are important, which is consistency in design. Once somebody learns to use part of my system, they should know how to use other parts of the system. Or if they aren't using my system, they should be able to know how to use my system because of other experience that they have. Whether it is how other standard websites that they use behave, right? So a lot of Edmodo was designed on Facebook. I tell people this, this is not a joke. The Edmodo web page is blue because Mark Zuckerberg is colorblind. Okay? Facebook is blue. I personally think Facebook is quite ugly. Facebook is blue because Zuckerberg is colorblind. And we were modeled on Facebook. So we're blue. Right? Should we be blue? Should we not have had a little more color? Would have been nice to have a few more colors. But uh, so, so two or three things I was going to say out there. Right? One is uh, try to be consistent with what the user already knows. Right? Defining, right, come on. defining new, uh, defining something new, and getting people to use something new, learn something new is very hard. Apple spent a lot of marketing dollars on learning, teaching people to do the click to zoom stuff, right? Or, or whatever to zoom stuff. They 
think money or making that happen. It wasn't for free. And now, if you don't do it, that's what customers expect. So be consistent with what the customer expects. Try to make your whole site consistent with that. Right? Don't try and do new paradigms on every different page. Copy good design ideas from other people. Don't try to invent them too much. And do A-B testing when you can. Right? But to do A-B testing, you need to have volume of users. By the time you've got there, you've kind of, you know, there'll be a VP of product management will solve that. It's a hard question to answer there. I think different startups look for different things. Uh, my personal bias has always been to look for people who know the basics well. Right? This is kind of be able to do stuff that, from their fundamentals. And who have a good, whether I would call it work ethic, energy level, desire to go do stuff, know air, some combination of that. Right? Those are the two things that I look for. I have never looked for people who knew a particular subject. Because the answer is, boss, if you have the right attitude, you learn whatever you need to. None of programming in my head is a particularly hard thing, if your basics are clear. If your basics aren't clear, then no amount of doing anything is going to help. Right? And seriously, when people say there is a thousand to one productivity difference, I completely doubt. Right. And there are a set of engineers who are negatively productive. Right? So, hire good people who have the right attitude. And I think with a lot less engineers, you might have to do But this is very much a personal bias and personal attitude. Uh, other companies look for specific skill sets. And there might be some places where I do look for that. I'm looking for a DBA, I want to look for somebody who, who is a DBA. But, you know, yes, other companies do look for specific skill sets and say, if you know this, I you have always got In my head, whether you know Ruby or Python, doesn't necessarily matter that much. As long as you are okay with moving from one to the other. Right. What about number of years of experience? If you have the right work attitude, I think, I mean, in any company, you want people across the bridge. Right? A good, smart, Young guy right out of college can bring a huge amount of energy. A guy who's older, who has the right work ethic, can bring a huge amount of energy. But if you are in the mode where, you know, boss, I'm kind of done, then it doesn't matter who you are, what you know, how much you know. It just won't be fun. Right? When I'm hiring new people, Part of the way I look at it is two years from now, I want to learn some cool stuff from them. Right? Because the answer is look, he's going to be working on a set of things, I'm never going to know those things. But I want to have that conversation, and at the end of that conversation, I want to feel yeah, I learned something about that conversation. Are we out of time? Yeah, out of time on your first talk. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good. So, okay. Uh, so, a few people have just joined. So, Amrish was just talking about startup life in Silicon Valley. We can maybe take a five minute break for the ones who were attend the first talk. And the second talk is going to be on cryptography. And I will try to keep it reasonably non technical. He promised that even I, I would be able to understand. It. So, <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs>